I'm visiting the baking capitals of the world, uncovering the tastes, traditions, and the recipes Look at that. of the world's best baking cities. I love coming into bakeries. From the historic streets of Palermo <laughs> to the multicultural city of San Francisco. Mm, I love it. Welcome to City Bakes. This time on City Bakes, I'm exploring the cultural capital of California and its most vibrant city. It's not my color, really. I meet a patisserie pioneer who's pushing boundaries. This is one of my favorites. Violet, really? <laughs> and discover a brand new bake that's a social media sensation. In for a penny, in for a pound. I get hands-on with some baking traditions. What are you doing uh, next week? Working here. <laughs> <laughs> I meet a baking hero. I love you, Chad. Yeah. I think we should get married. <laughs> and in a city famed for its bread. <sighs> Look at the structure on that fella. <laughs> I'll be doing some baking of my own and cooking up a savory bread and butter pudding. That's delicious. Welcome to City Bakes San Francisco. San Francisco has a lot to shout about. It's the founding city of the hippie culture, the birthplace of the gay rights movement, and if the hills are anything to go by, it's considered the second hilliest city in the world after La Paz, Bolivia. Well, the hills, there you have it. Look at that for a view. That is spectacular. But there's one other view, which I think will scream San Francisco. Look at that down there. That is Alcatraz. How cool is that? But even more iconic than the notorious former prison is the city's public transport. There's 40 cable cars that run all over the city, and this is one of them. You can feel the vibration of the cables underneath, which these things run on. Put your finger in there. <laughs> if I go deep enough, it'll cut it off, I'm sure. <laughs> The cable car network is just over 140 years old, and the city isn't that much older. It was put on the map in 1849, when almost overnight, it became the main frontier town for the great Californian gold rush. Most of the fortune hunters arrived down at the bay, so that's where I'm headed to. Now, I'm here at Fisherman's Wharf, and this area here is all street food. Now, the typical street food you get in San Francisco is obviously the clam chowder, which is actually inside a sourdough. This one looks like the oldest one. This is the one I'm going to check out. Trab. Brilliant. Right, I think while I'm here, I've got to try a chowder. It tastes good. It actually tastes a bit like chicken soup. That's a hell of a hearty meal, isn't it? And it's that doughy bowl that makes the city a bucket list destination for me. For a bread man, it's legendary. San Francisco was known and is known today as the sourdough capital of the world. So I'm on a sourdough mission to find the best San Fran has to offer. And where better to start than the city's oldest and original bakery, Boudin's, which opened in 1849 during the Gold Rush boom. The French brought their sourdough technology with them, brought their baking skills and started making it in San Francisco. But you've got to have a look at this. This place feels very much like a, like a fairground, really. It's bizarre. You've got teddy bear sourdough, baby turtles, all this shaped bread. It's fair to say that this isn't what I was expecting from one of the most ancient breads in the world. 
Sourdough is basically a bread risen, not with the yeast that you buy in the shop, it's a little packet. It's risen with just water and flour blended together and left for, for men for normally about two weeks. And you feed it with more flour and it forms yeast. It makes yeast, which is wild yeast, which comes from the air. And it gives a very, very different flavor to it. It tastes a bit like initially vinegar, so you get that sharpness, but then you get that depth of flavor with it as well. For me, sourdough should be made by hand, whereas this place feels a little bit too manufactured. When you look at that bread, it's all uniform, it's all perfect. It's almost taking the baker's hands away. This is sourdough on an industrial scale. But I can't come to the city's longest standing sourdough bakery without trying any. Now, interesting loaf. Not much of a smell. I expected more of a smell, to be honest. It's a nice bread, although not particularly sour. Looks like cotton wool. It doesn't look as open as I expected it to be. What I look for is a good chew, a good crisp, and a sour that lingers in the mouth, but not too overwhelming. But then again, not to dissipate straight away. It's finding that middle ground. I'm a bit disappointed in that one. Boudin's might be the oldest bakery, but this just isn't the iconic artisan San Fran sourdough loaf I had in mind. Not to worry, I've got a bag load more to try from bakeries from around the city. First off, Pan Bakery. Look at the structure on that fella. <laughs> now that's what I expected to see. Big irregular air holes, that would make fantastic toast in the morning. I like that one. Next is Josie Baker bread. But again, it loses the flavor almost immediately, which is interesting. Sourdough tends to hang around, so it's not particularly strong. That's not a winner. Next up, Acme Bakery. Funny name. Quite a tight structure, not particularly open. Could do better. Last one, Tartines. Now, I have heard of this bakery. Jeez. But it's definitely got a crust. Look at the structure on that. Wow. That is a great sourdough. It's big, it's bold. I love the colour, I love the caramelisation, I love the chew. I like the sour that stays all the way through. The texture is amazing. That's the bakery I want to go and check out. But before I leave the waterfront, there are some lively residents I'd like to drop in on. Hello. Hello, Paul. Welcome nice to, to Pier 39. Hello. Well, let, let me show you around in our, uh, our frat party here <laughs> on the dock. <laughs> These Californian sea lions first started hanging out here after the 1989 earthquake, thanks to an abundance of local fishy food. And Pier 39 guide Sheila Chandor has been their biggest fan ever since. So are they fairly tame? They're not tame at all. They're actually genuinely wild animals, and yet some people will, like, throw a ball over and think they're going to balance it up. No. <laughs> We've had everything. We've had people throw dog food over. I know they look like Labradors, but that's taking the mickey a bit, isn't it? <laughs> but do you know they're more intelligent than dogs? A are lot they? of people don't know that. Anything's more in intelligent than my dog, I tell you. I've got a chocolate Labrador <laughs> that looks not too dissimilar to that one on the right-hand side. What's his name? Rufus. Rufus, he didn't mean that. <laughs> no, he did. <laughs> Right, enough of the local wildlife. I'm off to sample more of tartine sourdough and, more importantly, meet the baker behind the amazing bread I tried earlier. Chad Robertson, who I must confess is somewhat of a legend in the baking world. Chad's the sourdough king, recognised throughout the US as one of the best bakers in the country, but also he's recognised globally as well. What he doesn't know about sourdough really isn't worth knowing. And for me, this... It's going to be a pleasure. Tartines has actually been a mecca for San Francisco sourdough fans since 2002. But just last year, Chad opened a second store, the manufacturing. Chad. Good morning. Pleasure to meet you. Mate. Hey, pleasure, pleasure to meet to you. Me. Welcome to uh, Tartine Manufacturing. I can't wait, mate. Lead on. Yeah. All 5,000 square feet of this place has been designed to put the bakery at the heart of the action. Straight away you come in, you can smell it, can't you? You can smell yeah. the sour. Yeah, so we're trying to take the bakers out of the basement. And they normally have no natural light. Yeah. They're like bats, because they work all the hours in the morning. Yeah, yeah. And then when the daytime comes, they sleep. Oh, pale and tasty. Yeah. And... Exactly. <laughs> These boys bake 600 loaves a day, 
And despite all the high-tech bespoke kit that Chad has had designed himself, it's still very much an artisan operation. Well, come on in. This is our dough room. Hello. <laughs> well, that's not an American accent. No, no. Really. <laughs> so I'm English. You're English? Where are you yeah, from? from London. How long have you been here? I've been at Tartine for six years. Yeah, and you're, so you're a baker before? I was a chef. I kind of, like, sidetracked into baking because I um, tasted Chad's bread. And then after that, I was kind of That's bugging it. Chad every day to, till he would give me a job. Like, was I wouldn't leave him alone. Was he giving you grief <laughs> I needed to work here. Yeah, work for Chad. That's the kind of passion Chad's sourdough inspires in people, and it all begins with his own unique natural yeast culture. What us bakers call the starter. The sourdoughs I was taught to use were more traditional, like eight to 12 hours old. And what we've kind of done over the years, is it's gotten younger and younger. So this, we use this about two hours after we feed it. Chad's dough is also much wetter than most, which gives it that amazing air bubble structure. But it needs some proper TLC. It's not kneaded, but folded instead. So you're yeah. not knocking any air out of that. You're literally just folding it in together yeah. and pleating it together. It's a nice technique. I've never seen it quite like that before. And the idea is to put tension into it, but yeah. be very gentle. Yeah, yeah. But you can't rush bread like this. Each loaf is tucked into its own little basket, a banneton, and left to rise for a whopping 24 hours in the Rolls Royce of proving ovens. I love the whole idea and the ethos that you brought to this business now. The way I say it is using technology to empower artisanal methods. Yeah. Chad started baking back in the 90s, when sourdough wasn't the fashionable loaf it is today. When I first apprenticed from uh, learning bread, I, I mean, I walked into this bakery on the, on the East Coast in Massachusetts, and, and I smelled like sourdough. And I, I had never smelled that. It just hit me. And by the end of the day, I decided, you know, this is what I need to learn how to do this. Not content just to school with the best sourdough baker in the US at the time, Chad hot-footed to France to learn from his mentor's mentor and brought back the artisan knowledge to the States, transforming the entire sourdough scene. What's this one, then? This looks like it's burned, but this is actually a, um, a malted marble rye. We mix two doughs. One is like the country dough, and then the other one has, like, chocolate malt powder, and malt yeah. syrup, some ground caraway. That looks amazing. I love that. You have that sweetness in there as well. But it's more of a, a malt than it is a sweetness. Yeah. And I love the fact that you're not scared to put colour on it. I agree. I think it's, it's, it's essential. I mean, look at that. Yeah. I like that. What a great life. But it's not just bread Chad makes with his sourdough. Many pastries are also made with it. This is a little brioche bun. This one's a savoury one. So we basically make a little hole in the middle yeah. and then Insulate it with a piece of bacon, yeah. crack an egg inside, and then you bake it, and it's got your per perfectly sort of soft baked egg. I have to get a bit of that yolk. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a real baker's breakfast. I've got, I've got to show these guys. Who's not moved by that? Everyone wants the uh, <laughs> savory, savory for breakfast, yeah. I love you, Chad, yeah. and I think we should get married. <laughs> that is delicious. I'm not kidding either. Chad is my new baking hero. I think what he is, is a scientist, a little bit geeky. I think his passion for bread is obvious, and I think he's a genius. Yeah. I'm in San Francisco for my very first time. That is pretty cool. It's 8 a.m. And I'm heading to a bakery that has people queuing around the block for just one of its bakes. You've heard of the crow nut? Say hello to the croffin. I'm intrigued. But is it a great bake or just a gimmick? Good morning. Hi. Bridget, the manager here at Mr. Holmes Bakehouse, is letting me in on the secret. Is it part croissant, part muffin? Yeah, it is. So it's. Croissant dough that's baked in a muffin tin. So it has the shape of a muffin. So it doesn't taste like a muffin? No. It's just a croissant. Croissant, yeah. 
Bridget is keeping the recipe under wraps, but apparently the dough takes three days to make. It's shaped into muffin tins for its final proof, gets baked, cooled, covered in sugar, and filled with creme pat. <laughs> so, uh, every day they have a different filling. Today is matcha. It's our most popular flavor. Matcha tea. So yeah, you've got the flavor tea. of the matcha tea going through it. Wow, okay. It's fascinating. It's clever. <laughs> it's flaky, it's buttery, and it does actually taste quite nice. Although the bakery opens at 7 a.m. for general pastry sales, the cruffins don't come out till 9, and the sales are restricted to two per person. That's a great ploy. All for a cruffin? I wouldn't queue up for anything <laughs> for half an hour. Time for me to get my hands on and help put this lot out of their misery. OK, guys, start coming in. Hello. How many cruffins are we doing today? Two. Thank you very much. Hi. How many cruffins are we doing today? But what's Two. obvious okay. is these guys aren't just here to eat cruffins. Are you taking a picture with a cruffin? Yes. Why? Yeah, because... <laughs> why, you, why, why do you want a picture of that? I don't know. I guess because everyone else has a picture right. of it. That's what it is, isn't it? That's yeah. what it is, because yeah. everyone else has got one. This is bad, isn't it? I can't knock it, though, especially as we're in the motherland of computer tech and social media. Instagram, Google, Facebook and Apple are all San Fran Bay innovations. So it seems right that the city has a baking internet hit all of its own. In for a penny, in for a pound. At the end of the day, no matter how cool or trend-setting it is, anyone getting people excited about bakes and baking is no bad thing in my book. It's fascinating. It's all about the internet. It's all about that feeling of we're getting something special, we're getting something that no one's going to get. And that, I think, is fascinating to see. I'd be selling tea and coffee up the line as well, making a few quid. Now, one of the things I like to do in any new city is to get up high to get my bearings. Thank you. And at 210 feet, you can't get much higher than the Coit Tower on Telegraph Hill. At least there's a lift there. That's good. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> this is high. Look at this. Wow. You begin to realize, actually, that San Francisco is known as the San Francisco Peninsula. So three sides of it surrounded with water. It essentially just sits on its own, this little finger popping out. And then around here is the main city. In 1906, there was a big earthquake. It was 7.8 on the Richter scale. Now, that's a whopper. And it flattened most of San Francisco. The whole thing had to be rebuilt from scratch. Just thinking about earthquakes now, it's probably due for one in California. I think it's time we got down. <laughs> the next bakery I'm visiting was built not long after that seismic event. It's been a North Beach neighborhood institution for over 100 years. It's Liguria, a family-run Italian bakery who said I can lend a hand. Hello, Mike. Hey, Paul. Nice to meet you, buddy. Nice How you to doing? meet you. Hi. Wow. Just, just in time to help us uh, get some of these. Right, the OK. Mike Siracco and his family bake one bread and one bread only. And it's not sourdough, but an Italian classic, focaccia. Just making focaccia makes life a lot more straightforward when it comes to the baking. But you can see all the different ones here, the herbs, the rosemary, the olives, the mushroom, tomato. They're great focaccias. I love focaccia. The family came over from Liguria in the early 1900s with their traditional recipe, and Mike has agreed to let me loose on his dough. What are you doing uh, next week? Working here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have done this before. We used to do it this way to make the holes in it, but this way we just roll in the pan. All right, get it. Makes, makes life yeah. a lot easier, doesn't it? 
Oh, that's fine. It's easy, isn't it? Yeah. Wow, that's brilliant. Isn't it? Whatever makes holes, you have to have the air in there. Absolutely. Once the dough is proved and risen twice, it's ready for one of Liguria's 11 traditional toppings. Are you just pouring this on? Yeah. Onion and tomato, followed by a handful of sea salt. This is secret. I can only touch this. <laughs> Finally, a liberal dousing of olive oil. And it's baking time. There's a couple of things in my life I get excited about. Cars and ovens. And this one is 105 years old. 1911 it was built. Um, it is an amazing bit of kit. Just gonna, you're, you're just going to line four of them up down the bottom there, then. Are you going to the right there? Yeah, well, you start there. The oven holds 14 trays at a time. Where do you want this one? Far right corner. Far All the way right. right. Seven. Far right corner. Yeah, watch this spin, so. Yeah, I know. It's just... <laughs> and trust me, getting them all in is no mean feat. That is tricky, that one. OK, it's in. Yeah. With customers waiting, I might have to leave it to the pros. Ten minutes, and they're baked. Total respect to these boys. They make it look so easy. Mike, can I try uh, a little piece of the tomato one, please? Yeah, sure. Or tomato. Sure. Tomato. Sure, Paul. Yourself. Wow. It's great. Real tang coming from the tomato. It's got a lovely flavour, though. The texture's amazing. What you're tasting here is a little bit of baking history, tradition. It's all around us. The equipment's still the same. It feels untouched by modern San Francisco. This is old San Francisco. My city visits always inspire me to get baking, and Mike's focaccia has got me thinking. What would you like? You want the plain, probably, then, huh? I, I, actually, I wouldn't mind the one with the onion. And this looks perfect. What are we going to do with this? I've been allowed to use the kitchens of a local community cooking school because I've got an idea. I'm going to show you how to make a bread and butter pudding, but this one is savoury with mushrooms and cheese. So simple, but so satisfying. OK, I have my focaccia. This is the focaccia we got from Liguria Bakery. I'm just going to chop it up now. This one's the onion one. I particularly like this one because it actually it gets better with age as the onion sits inside the bread. The flavours get stronger and stronger. You can use any bread you have going spare. Just keep those slices nice and chunky. Next, the custard. I want to make this quite rich, so what I'm going to do is initially put three eggs straight in and two egg yolks. I'm going to add a little cream and some milk as well and whisk it all together. Now, obviously, there's no sugar in there. This is a savoury custard. It's very quick to do. And actually, once you've soaked it all in with the bread and sitting it down, if you've got a dinner party, you can actually prepare it in the day, pop it in the fridge and then bake it. It is absolutely delicious. A little bit of pepper, a little salt, give it a final mix, and you're ready to start putting it all together. First, liberally butter an oven-proof dish. Lovely. Now, I've got some garlic. I'm going to roughly chop. Like a bit of garlic in this dish. Then you get your bread and start layering it all up inside the dish. A little bit haphazard. Now I've got some mushrooms here just chopped up, which is going to push in between some of the bread. Again, this will add another flavour to it and add a little bit of moisture to the dish as well. You can't beat a good mushroom. Next, a little chopped rosemary, just a sprinkling. And then I've got the custard mix, which I'm just going to pour in nice and gently. And this will soak with the bread. Make sure all the bread is covered with it. Finally, top with a good grated parmesan. Spread that all over the top. And that's it. Bake for 30 minutes until the custard is set. And the best way to serve it, hot out of the oven. That's delicious. Now, that, for me, actually, you could eat for brunch, 
or indeed for lunch. If you've got a few people around, that with a glass of wine, absolutely perfect. And actually, it's got the texture of a bread and butter pudding. But then you've got that beautiful cheese, the great focaccia, the onion, and then you have the mushrooms in there as well. And then a slight back flavor of garlic. It is absolutely delicious. I'm in San Francisco, exploring the best of the city's bakes, bakers and bakeries. So far, it's been an amazing mix of tradition and innovation. That looks amazing. I love that. But there's plenty more to explore. Packed into the city's 48 square miles are over 100 different neighborhoods, giving San Fran an almost villagey feel. So today, I'm going to pound the pavement and explore some of them starting with an unexpectedly risque cookie shop. Tastes great, all been made in there as well. There was a couple of shaped cookies that I can't actually show you. Welcome to the Castro. The Castro district was the birthplace of the gay rights movement. You'll notice on the cross in here that it's the colors of the rainbow. This it was invented in the 1970s in San Francisco to represent the gay movement in this city. Today, the flag is flown proudly, the world over, and the rights fought for here have changed lives for many gay people around the globe. What's really struck me about this city and its people, they're pioneers. Whether here in the Castro or in the neighboring Haight-Ashbury, where flower power started back in the 60s, they pushed the envelope and changed it for the rest of the world. It's very much a San Francisco thing. Next up, I'm headed a few blocks east to the Mission District. This is where the first settlers who came to San Francisco based themselves. It's been known over the years as been a bit of a downtrodden place, you know? And there's been a lot of money injected into it. Nowadays, it's quite hipster as well. So it'd be fascinating to see what sort of interesting things they have around here. Oh, there's an interesting thing right away. Nice bike. Shiny wheels aside, I've been told I had to visit a bakery here called Craftsman and Wolves. When it comes to patisserie, apparently, they've ripped up the rule book. Stuff looks really good. These flavor combinations are very unusual. They use flavors like hibiscus, persimmon, Buckwheat, yuzu, it all sounds very weird, but looks seriously high-end. Sometimes the words don't say enough. It's all about the taste as well. Can I try some of your pastries, please? Of course. Any particulars? I'm going to leave that entirely up to you. Will Werner opened Craftsman and Wolves two years ago, having spent 20 years honing his craft in hotel kitchens around the world. Wow. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Well, for looking at this, this has got a strong French influence. Yeah, I really kind of adopted that, that French style, like patisserie and like the classics, but I really like kind of to juxtapose it with a little bit of Asian influence, Middle Eastern influence, anything that we can kind of get and look at some different flavor combinations that seem unexpected. And then obviously we like to make very pretty things. This one's screaming at me. Yeah, this is a good one. This is one of my favorites. It's a violet cheesecake with vanilla. And we create a nice violet meringue. Wow. The violet meringue's delicious. Thank you. And I love that jelly. And actually, I was a bit... Violet, really? But actually, it works together well. And the next... Coffee yep. whipped with yuzu and coconut. Yuzu? This is a type of Asian grapefruit. Oh, the yuzu with that cream is so delicate. Very clever. Thank you. Your flavor combinations are just spot on. Thank you. Whether it's Japanese flavors or runny eggs hidden inside his muffins, Will is baking outside the box. Obviously, I've always thought of San Francisco as a bit of non-conformist, <laughs> which is actually what you've done in your baking. Mm -hmm. It's non-conformist. Yeah. I think what's great about San Francisco is, is it welcomes diversity, and it welcomes modern craft and pushing the envelope. It's a very European town. You know, there's a lot of uh, people coming overseas and working and coming here, so the palate, there's, customers are tough. Like yeah. they, they know they know when it's not quality and they know when it's not executed right. And what you're doing here is very French, but very San Francisco. Uh, cool, thank you. That's, that's exactly what I set out to do. They look stunning, and I'm honestly surprised by the flavors hidden inside. 
The final neighborhood I'm off to explore is probably the most recognizable, the USA's biggest Chinatown. Well, these look interesting. Look like, uh, actually look like eclairs. Oh, I hope they're eclairs. I love eclairs. I bet they're not, though. And that's the thing. While I know my chow mein for my chop suey, when it comes to Chinese baking, not a clue. So, to give me a taste of the neighborhood. Good to see you. Nice to meet you, buddy. How, How are you doing? doing? I've enlisted the help of local foodie tour guide, Andrew. This is one of the first places where the Chinese really came to America. Yeah. And so this is the original Chinatown of all of North America. So when was that? When did the Chinese start coming over to yeah, San Francisco? The Chinese started coming over during the gold rush. Yeah. Ah. It didn't always look this Chinese, though. It was rebuilt after the 1906 earthquake as an oriental fairy tale land to attract tourists. And talking of tourist attractions, obviously, when you listen to this man, yeah. remember, the voice is not a Chinese man. Okay. But but do put in a dollar okay. or more if you want. <laughs> it's not going to make the fortune any better. Neo, step up and hear the great wisdom of Confucius. To hear more ancient wisdom, relieve yourself of more monetary burden. <laughs> <laughs> nice try, buddy. Yeah. So go in and check that out. So that's your printed fortune now. You seem to be very impetuous and outspoken. Me? Me? Really? <laughs> <laughs> Me? Outspoken? <laughs> I know what my future right now holds, because Andrew has promised to take me to Chinatown's oldest bakery. Let's see, if there was one thing here that you would want someone to try, what would it be? Mooncake. Mooncakes. Mooncakes. In Britain, we have pork pies. It looks like a pork pie. Oh, yeah, it does. And so what is the filling made out of? Lotus seed. And this is traditional? Mm hmm Thank you. This is the lotus seed paste, mm. and this is the uh, egg yolk. Egg yolk. <laughs> you know, the more egg yolk, it's supposed to be lucky and tasty. Mm -hmm. uh, it tastes a little bit like almond paste. Yeah. The pastry is a little bit like a conventional short crust pastry, actually. And you're still the only bakery in town that cooks the filling? Yeah, the only. It's really hard. Yeah. A lot of labor. Eight hours for giving. Eight hours? Whoa. Yeah. I've never had anything like that in my life before. I'm sure they're delicious if I'd grown up with them. But sorry, mooncakes, I'll leave you to the locals. So, we've gone to Eastern Bakery and we've experienced some things that are traditionally Chinese. Yeah. Now I'm going to take you to something that's San Francisco. They're very Chinese-American. OK, this is going to be interesting. It is. Okay. Apparently, it's just down this alleyway. Let me ask you right away, does it look familiar to you? No? No, so this alley has a few names. Amongst them, the main one's Ross Alley, and the nickname is Hollywood Alley. That's a good name. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not for you, but because it's been the site of many movies, things like uh, Big Trouble in Little Chinatown. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, I love that movie. Yeah. Big Trouble in Little China. That was fantastic. <laughs> and here we are, the main attraction. Ah, it's the bakery. Yes, Golden Gate Fortune Cookie Company. Now, did you know fortune cookies are not Chinese? No. They found evidence that fortune cookies are like some pretty old Japanese religious wafer. Yeah. And it was in the Japanese tea garden here in San Francisco where allegedly Makota Hajiwara changed up the recipe and then folded them into the shape and started passing them out as palate cleansers. Right. During Japanese internment during World War II, the Chinese came in, took over the gardens, and then they were like, whoa, these are cool. Let's put little notes from Confucius in them and hand them out at our restaurants. And uh, by the time the Japanese got out, the Japanese wafer became the Chinese fortune cookie. Right. OK, that makes perfect sense then. So this right here is the last fortune cookie company in America to fold their cookies by hand. Wow. Yes. You can see this machine is just, it's very old. They're made from a simple batter of flour, sugar, sesame seed oil, and vanilla. It reminds me very much of a waffle machine. So what you've got, you've got a liquid being pumped in there. Exactly. Coming around, heating up. Mm -hmm. And then bang, it's turned into a fortune cookie. I had no idea this is how it's done. Well, this is the last place where it's done like this. You know, other than that, it's all fully automated. I think it's brilliant. And then I cannot let you leave without writing your own fortune. Um, 
What, you write your own? Yeah, you can write your own and they'll put in a cookie for you. This seems a very easy way to make my dreams come true. <gasps> Shock surprise. <laughs> my son passes his exams. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Josh. <laughs> Couldn't resist it, mate. Appreciate that, mate. Of course. Thank you very much, Andrew, for your tour. I'm glad. Glad you enjoyed it. Love it. Love it. My time in San Francisco is nearly up, but I can't leave this city famed for bread without baking some of my own. And I've heard of a place in Berkeley, on the east side of the bay, that's really piqued my interest. I'm going there to check out a bakery that's ran in a very different way, a very San Francisco way. It's called the Cheeseboard Collective. Founded in 1971, it's a deli cum bakery cum coffee shop, and it's run and owned by everyone that works there, all 55 of them. Hello. Hi. Are you Kathy? I'm Kathy. Hello, Kathy. Nice this to meet you. is Amri. Hi. Hello. Nice to meet you. Hello. This whole idea of being a cooperative. Mm -hmm. We're a democratically run cooperative yeah. where um, everybody has a voice. Yeah. We try to reach consensus when we do decision making. So, you know, everybody's on board, and it's just the most remarkable place to work. It sounds incredible. As its name suggests, this place started out as a cheese shop. Where are your American cheeses? Do you want to come around to the yeah, side? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. These cheeses are all artisan. What have you got? This is a cheese called Tear and Taste, which actually won um, Best in Show at the American Cheese Society competition yep. uh, two years ago, I believe. Mmm. That's got a lovely kick to it. Mm -hmm. That is lovely. So it's all made here in the States? Mm hmm Right, give me another one. So, from California, since, you know, we're here. If I'm here. This is from Cowgirl Creamery. It's a cheese called Wagon Wheel. It melts really well. So it's makes... got a melting quality to it as well. Yeah, it makes a great grilled cheese. Mm. Well, that's delicious. Mm -hmm. um, and it's given me an idea. Can I have a nice wedge of that, please? Sure. That'd be fantastic, thank you. In true collective spirit, Kathy and her co-workers have agreed to let me loose in their kitchen. And I'm going to bake my own Californian loaf, loaded with this local cheese and green olives. This is a very basic white dough, but it works. You can make this at home, and it's great for pizza bases, great for plain dough, and great, actually, for flavoured breads. Now, I've got some salt in there, I've got some fast-action yeast, add a little splash of olive oil, and then some water and get your hands in there. Give it a good mix around to incorporate all the ingredients into the strong white bread flour. A little bit more water. And when it's in a lump like that, it's good to go, and it's quite a soft dough. So I'm going to work that now with a little bit of oil. Gently massage and knead, massage and knead, until it comes together. It's about speed on a bench. The more you press it, and try and work it into a bench, it'll stick. So it's all about stopping it from sticking. You end up with a beautiful, smooth dough like that. I'm going to pop that into a bowl. While that proves, I have time to find out a bit more. How does everybody get on? Who makes the decisions? We have a million meetings. So we make decisions mostly by consensus. Things as simple as, like, are we going to take credit cards? Or are we going to open an hour earlier because there's a demand? This is not how I've seen bakeries run before. But here, the bread is fantastic. You have a, a variety of different breads here. Yes, we do. Which ones are your most popular lines? Well, I can tell you the one we love to make the most is the baguette. We roll each one by hand. They're sourdough and they're delicious. The shine on that's incredible. I know, it's beautiful and it's delicious. And you should take it because now you've touched it. But besides that, <laughs> can't help it. <laughs> Here, now it's All yours. Right, thank you there very you much go. indeed. That's great. I've what got else some do you cheese. want to touch? I've got cheese. I'll go around touching the lot. That really wind you up, wouldn't it? There you go. No, it's fine. <laughs> it looks great. The quality of the baking here is amazing. Yeah, well, we work really hard at it. I bet. We try really okay. hard. It's obviously paying off. My bread will have a lot to live up to. But I've got my very own cooperative, Kathy, to help me. 
Now, all I'm doing now is just stretching it out. It's a bit like focaccia. What I'm going to do is put these green olives in here. While I'm doing this, you know I'm going to ask... You want me to grate it? Can you grate it? Do you sure, mind? Sure, no. Thank you very much indeed. And the reason why I want to grate it, actually, is because I want it to infuse all the way through as much as possible so you get cheese in every bite. Any time today, Cathy, it's fine. There's no rush. OK, no worries. <laughs> See, I just can't help being the boss. How yes. does the rate of pay work? Does everyone get paid the same? We all get paid the same per hour we work. So anything from a kitchen porter to a baker to someone working so... in a shop, everyone's the same. That's incredible. And so what happens with the profit side of things? Once a year, we do share all the profits. Yeah. And we pay ourselves very well because we have no boss. <laughs> <laughs> OK. You can see what I've done here. I've got the cheese on the top. I'm going to fold this up, roll it up. Now, the size of this will make two. Chop this in half. Did you want this? Do you know what? I could use a banner. Ah, perfect, perfect, perfect. OK. I anticipate you. Thank you very much. <laughs> this, is, this is very cooperative. Yeah, that's right. A banneton. OK, you can buy these in a lot of the shops. Really, you should try baking in these. These give a very different look to a loaf. You have all the ridges on there. What you do is you get a bit of flour and you coat the inside with flour. Yeah. A, it stops it from sticking, but B, it creates a nice pattern on the bread. Pick up your bread, drop it into the banneton, do the same thing again, pick it up, drop it in there. Job done. After another prove, they're ready for the oven. I'm going to close this up now. Steam button. That's pushing steam. That's going to give my loaves a really good crust and sheen. If you haven't got a steam button, let's be honest, most ovens don't. What you do is you get a tray in the oven. Underneath, heat up a little metal pan or a cake tin. And then just before you close the door on the bread, pour water, cold water, into that tin. It'll instantly turn to steam, and that'll give you the same effect in your oven. While those bake, I'm going to find out a little bit more of how this place works. Hello. Hi. You're doing your, your work here? I am. Everyone kind of fills in whatever roles kind of fits with mm -hmm. their passions and their interests. So sometimes I'm here at the cheese shop. Yeah. Sometimes I bake the bread. <laughs> uh, sometimes I go upstairs and, like, work on the financial report and wow. pay some taxes. Hello. How long have you been here, then? Uh, I've had the pleasure of being here for almost three years. Wow. Um, there's some people that have been here since before the disco age and all that. But, yeah. It's, no, it's great. It's, it's a good feeling to wake up in the morning and, and knowing that you're contributing to something kind of yeah. bigger than yourself. I just find it totally alien for me to get around the head that everybody's paid the same, everyone does the same job. Because in my arena, I was always known as the one with the mouth, the, the boss, you know, giving out the orders. Oh, right. I just find it how the dynamics of that work, you know. You know, it's kind of cool to, like, you know, to kind of know that you're still kind of, like, all on the same footing. The responsibility shared. Exactly, exactly. I get that, too. Yeah. I get that, too. Exactly. It's brilliant. I was quite puzzled, probably, on how that sort of system works, but everyone seems to be really happy. It's a good vibe in it, you know, you feel... Everybody gets on, everyone just cracks on with the job, everybody knows each other's jobs, and everyone just sort of swaps over. And it, it works. There you go, it's living proof. It's been here 50 years. What a genuinely fascinating place. And there's one thing left to do. Share my bread with my new co-op co-star. Oh, look at that, the olives popping. Oh, the olives popping out, look. That smells amazing, actually. Does. But you can see all the way through. It's quite a light dough. It's very soft. Then you have the cheese that sits in there and binds the whole thing together. Yes, and I'll live in every bite. It's terrific. It's really delicious. It's lovely with the olives, actually. And the cheese kind of kind of fries the olives a little bit. It does. Bit, you know? Yeah, it does. You like it? Very good. Is it good? It's terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Kathy. I wish you every success for the next 50 years. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Come again and see us soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. My first ever visit to San Francisco hasn't disappointed. If anything, it's exceeded my expectations. The people of San Francisco 
don't sit back on the laurels. The people of San Francisco are forward-thinking people. Yes, they appreciate the history, but they want to make it better, not just for people in San Francisco, but for everyone in the world. And that translates to their food too. The bakes, the bread, from the Castro to the Fisherman's Wharf to Berkeley. The bakeries here celebrate tradition and innovation in equal measure. But above all, it's about quality. Yeah, I fall in love with San Francisco. Great city, great people.